So, um, welcome to our virtual KubeCon 2021 presentation. Thank you for coming, or thank you for watching online, as I should say. Um, we're going to talk to you today about the CNCF Research User Group, uh, who we are, what the group goals are, uh, who comprises the group, some highlights from recent sessions we've had, and also a survey of our constituents. Next slide, please. So yeah, the group is run by uh, myself and Ricardo. Um, I'm Jamie Poole. I'm a engineering manager at G Research. I manage a team called Compute Platform Engineering. We're responsible for all of our Kubernetes estate and modern uh, cloud native technologies at GR. Um, Ricardo? Yeah, so my name is Ricardo Rocha. I work at CERN as a computing engineer in the CERN cloud team. I focus mostly on containerized deployments, networking, and more recently accelerators and uh, machine learning as well. Uh, so we've been using Kubernetes for, for quite a while now. So, um, and we engaged in this group uh, when, it, when, it, when the idea came, I think it was uh, KubeCon Barcelona in 2019, I guess, early 2019. So yeah. Well, it's been it's been a pleasure to, to 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 work with Jamie as well and everyone else. Cool. So we'll talk quickly about the goals of the group here. So, as Ricardo says, I think we put the group together at the beginning of 2019. I feel it could have even been earlier than that, but it was definitely the KubeCon in Barcelona. Um, there was a bunch of people who came from different research computing institutes who wanted to use cloud native tech and wanted to solve the same kinds of problems. Uh, so we sort of came together, I think actually over lunch. And then from there, it sort of became a proper CNCF uh, group. And yeah, basically we want to just bring together people from different research institutions who want to solve the same common problems uh, using cloud native tech and really build a sort of research focused community um, who know how to deal with the same sorts of things that we will have to deal with, maybe slightly different from your traditional cloud native uh, technologists, I suppose. Yeah. Next slide. Uh, we ran a poll. Um, in fact, no, this wasn't the poll, was it? This is actually from our um, weekly, bi-weekly, sorry, meetings. Uh, we keep track record of who attends and who speaks. And uh, this was the results based on, I think, a uh, notebook that Ricardo put together, which he's gonna show you the gory details of in a minute. But you can see we've got quite a wide spread of institutions from around the world. So uh, I'm from G Research, so I often get a lot of us to come along. That's why our name's so big and central in there. CERN, a uh, big constituent part as well, always, always present. Uh, but yeah, quite a wide range here of different people from different universities, uh, private, public institutions from all around the world, actually, literally from the all the way from the UK to Australia and back again. So yeah, really great um, group of people to get together. Yeah, and it's even good to see like not only individual institutions, but in some cases we see. Well, I'm, I work on the physics side, so we see institutions like uh, NFN, which are actually very large uh, groups of um, of uh, different places in Italy, or EGI Foundation, which is uh, driving the grid infrastructure uh, in Europe. So yeah, it's um, it's been it's been quite a nice set of diverse uh, groups, and as Jamie said, uh, I, I guess. Because this is a research user group and uh, well, we do a lot of data analysis or at least the users of the services we, we, we provide do a lot of data analysis. So I, I thought it would be fun just to collect all the attendees from, from the agenda page and do a quick, a quick, um, a quick um, analysis on, on, the, on the list. So I, I, Two silly, very silly ones. In addition to the to the word cloud that we just saw, um, we we get, we got uh, sixty five unique attendees over the last ten minute ten meetings. So it's not like the the whole lifetime of the group, but just the last ten minutes, meetings, which is which is quite good. Uh, we had some some sessions, I think, with uh, like over thirty people. 
So it's been pretty active. And then also the, the different institutions, uh, we have 34 different institutions participating. Uh, so, so it's been, it's been very, very active. And if you're interested, I put here the link to, to, the, to the notebook as well. Yeah, so highlights here from the, the recent sessions we've had. The, the structure of the group at the moment is uh, we meet on the first Wednesday and third Wednesday of uh, every month, uh, currently 4 p.m. UTC. You want to get this right with time zones changing. Um, the structure typically is we just do intros. Anyone who hasn't come to the, the group before does a little intro of themselves and says hello to the group and we sort of greet them. Um, then ahead of time, we've decided on a, a particular topic we want to, to talk about uh, that session. We'll have a speaker who typically presents uh, the chosen topic for 15, 20 minutes, normally some kind of presentation, normally a little bit interactive if possible. I've got a screenshot here of uh, Jeremy from Oak Ridge talking about their really cool work they've done recently on POSIX integrations. Um, yeah, then Q&A for 10 or 15 minutes and then a bit of wrap up, talk about the the topics we want to do for next time and, and then move on. Um, we record all the sessions. Uh, they're all available on, on the GitHub page. Um, I think actually um, shout out to Cheryl Hung as well, who organizes it for us. Um, she's in fact going to live stream, I think the next one on YouTube. So, and we're going to try that out for a bit, see how that goes. So that should be really interesting. Um, but yeah, in terms of the, the recent topics, they've been quite diverse, uh, obviously all research focused uh, things that are, our members are, are interested in. Um, Mauro from G Research did a really interesting talk on OODC a couple of weeks back. Um, I think Ricardo, you put together the notebooks one that was very well attended, lots of interest there. Yeah. Um, if you want to cover that. Yeah, we had like uh, I think three different institutions showing how they are um, providing notebooks uh, on, on Kubernetes, uh, things like Took the Hub, or Binder, or uh, in some cases using tools and frameworks like Dask for Python. Um, so that that one was a pretty good one, and actually triggered some some follow ups uh, between the the people that showed interest in those, and uh, we started collaborating on creating a recipe. We'll, we'll talk a bit more about that one as well. But uh, but there there's a couple of other ones. I would also like do the shout out to Cheryl. She, she's been pushing for this group quite a bit and helping us with the, all the recordings and all the setup. And also Bob that, uh, that actually uh, founded the group, Bob Killen that founded the group at the start. But in, in terms of topics, I would I'd also highlight um, two that are very close to, to, to our needs as well. Uh, the first one would be a rootless Kubernetes. And this is very uh, um, important for for all those institutions running HPC clusters where you want to, to make use of some of the cloud native tooling, but you don't actually have um, root access to the nodes. So you need to, to, to deploy things in a different way. So it's quite important that all the components, not only Kubernetes, but ContainerD and uh, all the, the rest of the stack supports uh, rootless mode. Uh, and then the other one is image distribution because we typically do um, very large submissions of workloads um, and uh, being able to start these jobs quite fast is, is very important and also maybe it's the case for for everyone uh, researchers are not necessarily very good at um, layering their images so we often end up with very large images so we had a really nice presentation from akihiro suda for rootless and and also from uh, ktalk from ntt as well uh, talking about uh, uh, the container the snapshot and the SRGZ support. So th these are really, I, I recommend that if you're interested in these topics, it's a, it's a nice uh, way to start uh, to just watch the, the videos from these sessions. They're all, all available in the agenda page. Cool. You want to pick up, Jamie? Yeah, so um, we were thinking about what to what to do for this talk and how best to sort of convey what the group's all about and what our interests and uh, pain points and domains are. So sort of use the technique which we've used in the past, which is actually really effective, which is just to put a, a survey together uh, with some pointed questions about what the institutions do and what their main challenges are. Um, send that out and thank you to everyone who did reply, uh, who's already in, in the, the user group. Um, and in the next few slides, we're just going to go through some of the results 
uh, which are quite interesting actually I think and some of the answers are a little bit counterintuitive to what even we might have thought we would get back from from the group so yeah some quite interesting data here yeah and we, we'll keep the survey open so it's still time for everyone to jump in and then we can do an update uh, later as well but uh, yeah, we can start just with an overview of uh, the institutions that already replied. So um, we can see quite a, a span of different um, areas already in the names. Uh, there's a couple of uh, cases where there's more than one reply. I know, for example, for CERN, this happens because we actually have different groups at CERN that focus on different areas. Um, and yeah, everyone got the notification. So we ended up having more than one person replying, I guess, for, for Oak Ridge. It's a similar situation. Can I go, Jamie? Yeah, so no no surprises here. I suppose the, the, the bulk of it is um, sort of non-private sector anyway. I think private sector was just represented by me in the, uh, in the feedback, but we've got a lot of academia, a lot of government, um, a lot of non-profits uh, when you add it all together. Um, so yeah, it's um, sort of, I guess, not particularly surprising in the sense that that's where a lot, the bulk of the research happens in the world. Um, I expect there's a lot more private sector out there that aren't represented in our group. Um, so th these are definitely some people I'll be keen to sort of reach out to with this presentation and try and encourage to join the group as well to give a, their uh, their views as well. Yeah, yeah I think that there's quite a it's the the research use cases like yeah at at least for for CERN we you often associate them with research laboratories and academia but actually there's there's a lot happening in private sector with similar requirements mm -hmm. yeah this one was just to have an idea of the size of the institutions so we have I think probably one answer over ten thousand people most cases are. A thousand between a hundred and a thousand, so it's it's still pretty large. Uh, yeah, and quite a, quite a few uh, between a thousand and ten thousand as well. So yeah, we, we're talking pretty large scale uh, requirements here. Here we've got the different areas of research which people primarily support. So quite strong showing from physics, bioinformatics, and. Um, generic research platforms. I guess there's potentially a little bit of a murkiness as to what's going on in there. But yeah, the, the, the bulk of it, I would say, is sort of science and scientific research, uh, I would say, from looking at this this feedback. Yeah. Yeah, internet too, also for, for more education. Yeah, mm. It's quite interesting. And astronomy, astronomy that there's the one one community that hasn't been very, very present, uh, which is from from the specifically the SKA, but actually from astronomy, we have uh, quite active uh, members uh, from from Alma, from the observatory in Chile. So that's I think we should we should get them to do a talk at some point, even to to show off their their nice telescopes. That would be very cool, actually. Yeah, just to see what the others are up to, or the, or just organize a, a meeting in the middle of the uh, desert in Atacama. Yeah, I think I completely agree. Okay, so um, this is really good to see. Um, very, very clear that the vast majority of the group are already using Kubernetes in production. So this is a group of people who do really understand the platform and are really using it for value add and getting something out of it. This is not just a sort of collection of people who are hobbyists or, you know, trying it out for the first time. This is really sort of proper production use at scale. Certainly, I know CERN of big scale users and, and so are we actually, so very large amounts of compute running on Kubernetes in production. Um, however, that being said, there are some groups here who are sort of just starting out and just learning. So it's also a good way for people to get in and learn more about the platform, see what it can do for you. Yeah, it's, it's even more surprising because yeah, we'll see also in the next answers, but, it, but there is a kind of a, a learning curve to, to get into Kubernetes, both on the infrastructure and the usage. So it's quite nice to see that so many people are already using it in production for research as well. And then, yeah, the, the, other, the other question we asked was uh, where are the, um, which kind of infrastructure is being used? So I, I'm actually qu quite surprised that um, there is um, 
such a high percentage of on-premise deployments, but I guess it's quite specific for for this community because we have large uh, uh, da big data and, and large scale deployment requirements. So I guess people already have uh, this infrastructure on-premises and they just uh, convert it to, to use Kubernetes and Cloud Native. But uh, because I guess for, for industry, this, this plot might look quite a bit different, um, more tendency to, to public cloud only in some cases. Yeah, so yeah, I think you're right. I think certainly for the sorts of institutions that we tend to deal with, these have been sort of large scale HPC research shops for a long time, long before, you know, cloud native tech existed, I suppose. So you probably already own large data centers and amounts of hardware. So yeah, for, certainly for us as well, it's a case of how to reuse that in a cloud native way um, without necessarily yeah. jumping straight into public cloud. Yeah, and the follow up to this would maybe to this survey would be to to understand better the requirements for hybrid deployments as well. Because I know in our case, we were looking to extend uh, the on-premises resources and try to fish for, for things that we, we don't have too many like GPUs and accelerators. So it would be nice to understand not only why, but also how people are doing this. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah, I mean, yeah, we're just looking at the why people are picking up Kubernetes and using these cloud native tools. I think it's kind of interesting. A lot of this, the same with later slides as well, I think is really we're just sort of highlighting the, the benefits of Kubernetes, but really showing that you can actually make use of those benefits in a research setting. Um, so you can imagine in, in research institutions, things like reproducibility and fast iteration are super important because you need to be able to rely on your data. So that's why certainly for us, I think things like tools like Kubernetes really, really pay off. Yeah, yeah, definitely I agree. I think it's pretty clear, like eight out of 12 talk about reproducibility. So that's a big one. It's a much less about multi-cluster, which is kind of interesting. So that's something that maybe worth following up as well. Mm -hmm. And then this one surprised me at least uh, that uh, so many, so many deployments uh, or yeah, half of the deployments actually more if we count the mixed, uh, actually uh, provide direct access to the clusters uh, to the end users. Um, but but it's it's nice nice to see uh, because yeah it it is a big, a big. Um, move forward to do this uh, but yeah traditionally at least in our deployments we already have systems on top that uh, that will do the higher level uh, expose the services uh, to the users in a higher level way not really necessarily with the Kubernetes API but we do have some services like this as well I don't know if that's your case as well yeah we definitely have a mixture um, our researchers don't necessarily directly access Kubernetes all, all the time. Uh, they have a bunch of tools to do so, but then there's a sort of, there is a sort of mixture because then they do to sort of look at the guts of it and see what's going on. So I think it's good to be able to trust people to um, to do that and to be able to set it up so that they can easily um, mm -hmm. with a little bit of education, I suppose, of how the platform works. Because I think, again, we've, we've said it before, we'll come to it, but it is quite a complex platform and allowing people direct access also implies that they need to understand a sort of baseline level of what's what's going on. So maybe some some interesting topics. We already covered OIDC, but like going deeper into how people are using our back and things like the open policy agent might be things to follow up as well. Yeah. So here we just, uh, I guess, threw out a bit of a list of sort of popular cloud native projects, which are uh, relevant in the community today to see what the sort of spread was of uh, people across our group using these things. So no surprise, Kubernetes are out front almost 100%. Um, a lot of Prometheus, pretty standard way, I suppose, of collecting metrics and looking at your data. I, I noted that service mesh was particularly low here. Um, chatting to Ricardo just before this, I think probably actually in a research setting, that's not maybe as not maybe that surprising. And it's less about services and more about you know batch and HPC and that kind of thing. Um, but yeah, a, a good spread of of these different tools. I'm also very interested who, who from the 12 responses is not using Kubernetes, which is uh, kind of curious here. 
Uh, the other two that are interesting as well is Argo. I guess uh, it's it's gaining quite a lot of popularity also for for managing workloads. So that's an interesting one. Uh, I know tools like Kubeflow also rely on it, and there's others. Yeah, CI/CD's come up a few times as a topic to talk about as well to see how people are managing their estates because there's there's lots of different models. I know like even me and you do things differently. You tend to sort of provision clusters for people to then use and they own them, whereas we do the more sort of managed approach. But right. both approaches, you need sort of quite good, reliable CICD. So yeah. Um, yeah, it's very interesting stuff. Cool. Then what types of workloads? So I guess this is, um, it's pretty amazing that 10 out of 12 are doing Jupyter Hub and interactive analysis types. I guess the popularity of these sessions in, in this specific session in the, the, the group kind of also showed this. And second is batch. So I guess th th these are clearly the two top, top things that um, the members of the group are focusing on. Yeah. It's kind of surprising the, the amount of people doing databases on Kubernetes, but I guess, yeah, why not? <laughs> it, will, we, it, it will come more and more, I'm sure. It's, yeah. um, I don't think, I mean, we, we've started, we're certainly not doing any databases in Kubernetes in production yet, but um, I think over time, as sort of persistent storage tech gets more and more reliable in this space, people run more stateful services, I don't, I don't see why not. The one one curious uh, one one thing that we've been trying to do is offload uh, our central services, especially for the storage side, and provide in cluster storage in addition to the persistent centralized storage. Uh, in a way, to have, for example, if you're running large workflows, to to kind of have uh, offload the temporary storage from from the central services. This is something we are looking at as well. Yeah, and then we get to the to the two main uh, two last answers, and this is kind of the main benefits. Clearly, here there's nothing really that jumps out. Uh, it's all pretty pretty similar to to the general benefits from from Kubernetes. There, it's a nice list here. I think it's all covered. And then the last one we have is the single main pain point. I don't know if you want to highlight something, Jimmy. Yeah, I mean, I think the two ones that jumped out for me was the uh, different mental model, steep learning curve, along with overall complexity. I think we all know it is quite a complex system. And once you get over that sort of initial learning cliff, you can really start to you know, maximize the sort of benefit from it. But I, I can see that for people coming on board, it's, it's definitely you know, quite complex and there's a lot going on. Um, there's other points here which sort of sign to that around sort of prepackaged software and the integration with other systems. Um, but yeah, it's uh, it's it's clear that there's it's not completely smooth sailing for people, but I guess that's why we come together in these sorts of groups to work yeah. out the best ways of uh, overcoming these problems. Yeah, the prepackaged software is quite interesting as well because for, for most generic tools, it's probably already there. It might just be that we are lacking something on, on this specific area for research and scientific area. Mm -hmm. And then the, inter the other interesting one is actually reproducibility because it was one of the like top uh, reasons to, to rely on Kubernetes and cloud native, but then it's also specified as uh, one of the main points um, for, for using Kubernetes. So it's clearly work to be done here still. Yeah, so and then the last bit is uh, regarding where we can help the most. So yeah, I, I think it was, th the goals of the group are, are also um, shown here. So it's, it's increasing the visibility of the research use cases, but then there's, there's some specific things. Uh, we, we saw in the previous uh, answer also this, this need to help and package catalog and software. And then the, the other one I would highlight also is this uh, idea to maintain a set of recipes and best practices for, for the use cases we discussed. Um, and so I think th this is something that is already happening or starting to happen, but it's true that we, we haven't had any, any result yet out of the group for, for these kind of recipes. Yeah, I think there'll be some real benefit there. That's definitely something that would address some of those pain points. 
just having something that researchers can kind of pick up and use without having to do too much thinking. You know, when we discussed the Jupyter Hub, actually, there, there was um, kind of a lot of commonality, but a few a few differences also on how people are, are deploying their workloads. Uh, one, one, one was also when you deploy your interactive analysis and then want to offload to an external system, what, what is that? And, and there was a discussion about how to integrate with things like HD Condor. There are other discussions on how to integrate with Kubernetes itself. Um, there were other solutions, so may maybe maybe this is something where we should put the focus on. Yeah. And yeah, I think that's that. This is the very last one. And yeah, good. yeah, just some, just some comments here that people have for suggestions. But generally, it looks like people are enjoying the group, and it's good to see that people appreciate that the group exists. So uh, we're very happy to to keep it going, and just want to encourage people's. Um, Collaboration, really. I think the next slide just uh, yep. talk about our our plans to build on the momentum we have now, collaborate on these recipes, and yeah, just really engage with other groups as well. Try and get people on board and um, solve some of these problems. So yeah, I think the final slide. If you move on to uh, how to get involved, I think it's probably enough of me and Ricardo talking. But yeah, come and have a look. This is our, our GitHub page. Um, it's got the details of the Zoom meetup, which we do currently first and third Wednesday of every month. Um, if you're on CNCF Slack, then there's a public group, UG Research, user group research. And yeah, thank you everyone for all your participation over the last uh, couple of years and let's keep it going. Yeah. Thank you and see you, see you soon. See you soon. And yeah, I think we've got some time for questions now. Yeah, thanks.